Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on our show, I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Ian Rubenstein. In 2003, Dr. Rubenstein, an ordinary family physician working in a busy medical practice in London, England, found himself propelled into a strange world populated by mediums, psychics, and ghost hunters. Intrigued by his experiences, he decided to see how far he could develop his own psychic intuitions. Dr. Rubenstein is the author of the book, Consulting Spirit, a doctor's experience with practical mediumship. And his website is www.drianrubenstein.com. And of course, you can visit we don't die radio.com and click on episode 133 to see a picture of this wonderful man we're talking to. Dr. Ian, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you, Sandra. Well, you're welcome. I'm very excited to talk to you as I've just spent the last hour reading your book or started reading your book. And it's just such a compelling story. And I'm on the edge of my seat to see how it all unfolds. So I am delighted that I get to actually hear your story from your mouth. Well, I wrote the book because it started, the events that happened to me were so weird. Um, I don't normally keep a diary. In mm -hmm. fact, I've stopped keeping a diary now because I've got used to weird stuff. But I, uh, I kept a, a Microsoft Word document, just jotted down the events as they happened. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, b b because I just couldn't make sense of them. Um, and I had to get them out of my head. So, so I, it, I thought I'd just write, write them down. It's and great. Um, I realized I had a, uh, you know, at the end, after a couple of years, I'd had notes that formed the basis of my, of my book. Well, well, um, well done. Would you tell us a little bit about you and maybe how you sure. got into the, how long you've been a physician and maybe a well, little I'm bit about six, your practice? I'm, six, I'm 61 years old now. So I qualified in medicine in 1978. Uh, medicine in this, in the UK is not a postgraduate subject something that a lot of americans find difficult to understand so um it, it was a it's a five-year undergraduate course okay so i was i was just shy of 23 when i qualified excellent um so i've been practicing medicine ever since and i've been in family medicine what we call general practice mm -hmm. um since 1982 and i've been a partner at my practice which is eagle house surgery in the london borough of enfield um since 1984 some of your listeners may be aware of the Enfield Poltergeist. Is that something you're familiar of? I am not. I, I've well, seen the, something about it on... Well, the Enfield Poltergeist was uh, a very famous poltergeist case in 1976. And uh, that's actually in the area in which I practice. Um, and that's that's become... That's very well known um, amongst people who know poltergeists. Certainly okay. very well known in the UK. There's been a, a film out recently in a TV series. So and I, I actually look after the fa uh, w the family uh, that are related to the alleged spirit that came through in that poltergeist case. When you yes, had heard so. about that prior to mm -hmm. getting involved in doing your research on mediumship, did, w were you open to the idea? Did you think it was a little bit crazy? No, no, I've, I've, I've never been... Um, well, it, yeah. To be honest, I'm, I'm interested in paranormal phenomena okay. um, uh, and always have been. Uh, particularly, I actually... I, I I'm a UFO nut. I mean, I, I've always liked flying saucers. Um, so the, the spiritualism of mediumship was never really my thing. I mean, I've always kept an open mind on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've always been into empowerment. I've always felt that uh, we are much greater than we know. Um, when I was at school, I taught myself to hypnotize the, my, 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 the kids at school. And, um, and actually, when I qualified as a doctor, I had a, a, a hypnosis practice. I used to do a lot of hypnosis. Um, so I've always been interested in sort of personal empowerment and, and, and I've always had the inkling that we are much greater than we realize. Oh, very good. Um, uh, as regards to life after that, you know, when you're, when, I, when you're young, if you're, if you're happy, you don't really come across losing any, any loved ones. You don't really think about it, do you? No. So, um, it wasn't really uppermost. Um, so yeah, but, but I've kept, kept an open mind. I mean, I've always been interested in weird stories. There's a magazine called Fortean Times in this country. I think the equivalent is the Anomalous magazine in America. And I've always read that, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't say I was, I mean, certainly would never have gone into a spiritualist church. I would have thought spiritualists were just a bit odd. Mm -hmm. um, um, but 
so so I suppose I, I'm certainly not closed minded, but I wouldn't say I was into it. In fact, really, at the time this happened, I really was into computers. I mean, my, my hobby is computer programming. And I was um, I, I spent nine years uh, writing medical software. Wow, I thought I thought it was going to be the next Bill Gates, but that never happened. Um, but <laughs> not yet. Is, is it, no, well, it's not going to happen. No, it's a, it was a medical rostering program, which 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 was useful. I mean, we used it, and a couple of other practices used it. But um, so really, I was. I mean, paranormal stuff was really the last thing on my mind when that happened. Um, but I did have a a couple of incidents when I was earlier, um, uh, when I was younger. So. Um, Actually, I, recently I realised, uh, I mean, that I actually had a, what you could call a near-death experience when I was nine. Hmm. Um, and, and, I mean, I used to tell the story about the, the day I almost died, but I never really linked it to my subsequent paranormal experiences. It's only been the last few months I was reading about near-death experiences and uh, realised that a lot of people have these. They often come back with psychic intuitions and gifts. True. So, so when I was nine, I had my tonsils out. And um, it, it, it went a bit wrong and I started bleeding from the operation site. So I lost a lot of blood and I had to uh, be re-anesthetized and, and have the tonsillar bed cauterized. Um, and when I was under the anesthetic the second time, I had this vivid recollection, and I've had it all my life, of, it's very odd, that there was something being extruded from the center of my body like a like molten glass twisting or, or toffee or taffy you'd call it mm-hmm. being twisted round and on the end of that was a tiny little light and I was that little light and I was sort of twisting and spiraling down a dark ribbed tunnel um, and I heard it, I could hear a high-pitched noise and then nothing you know then, then I just woke up in my hospital bed I've always had that um, I never really linked it until recently um, with my subsequent paranormal experiences but i wonder if, if that might be linked to it in some way very well could be uh, yeah yeah um but i mean i didn't meet anybody there and the, and there was no light i mean i, mean, I the, the most abiding thing of that is that i was a tiny little spark on the end of this big sort of thick stalk that was being twisted around mm. and i i my essence was a tiny little spark on the end of that so i, I I'll, I'll leave that just hanging for the for the moment but the most impressive a paranormal phenomenon I, I've ever witnessed was what spiritualists call transfiguration, which, um, well, I'll describe to you what happened. I didn't know what it was at the time. Okay. But um, it was the end of the first year at medical school, so I was 19. And all, all my friends, we'd gone off to university, and we'd come back for the summer vacation. And I was with my friend Nick, um, who met a girl at his university called Felicity. So Nick had brought Felicity back with him for the summer holiday. She was staying with him. And uh, my sister and I were um, were at Nick's house. And Felicity had long, dark hair. And she was quite pretty, but she was a sort of um, darkly complected one with, with hair down to her waist. Um, and we were at Nick's house in his living room about midnight in full electric light. So I was sitting opposite Nick and Felicity, and my sister was sitting... So that she could see this side of us. So, so the three of us were 19 and my sister was 15 at the time. And um, I'm talking and all of a sudden I look at Felicity and in her place is a blonde haired snow queen. And um, this was uh, a sort of ageless, imperious looking face. Um, shoulder length blonde hair with a fringe. Very high cheekbones. Very thick, strangely distorted white lips like she'd had frosted lipstick on her lips. And these very piercing blue eyes that looked straight into me. And I got in about instantly several messages. Well, the first message was, was uh, um, stop, what you're doing is wrong. And what, what actually was happening was is that although she was going out with my friend Nick, she also liked me and I was playing <laughs> on her emotions. So it was very adolescent. But the first thing was stop, keep back, what you're doing is wrong. And the second message, and this happened like instantly, although mm-hmm. there were separate messages, um, mark this. No, there's more to life than meets, than meets the eye. And then one day you'll understand. And that happened one or two seconds. And I think my jaw hit the floor. And then I felt this force knocking me back with this gaze. It was like a white light without the white light. It was very strange. And at the precise instant that this happened, I heard my sister screaming at the top of her voice. I mean, she, she jumped up out of her chair, 
It was absolutely hysterical. Screaming, my God, can you see those lips? Can you see their lips? And I turned to my sister and said, what, you've seen it too? And I looked back at Felicity and she was completely normal. But my sister had described the same face that I saw, even to the distorted white lips, which is quite interesting. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that was in, I mean, that, and I, now, subsequently, of course, when I got into spiritualism, um, I've been to various churches, spiritualist churches, where they, they're meant to be doing demonstrations of transfiguration. I can tell you, they don't cut it. This was amazing. This was in your face, no nonsense, barn door, absolutely knock you dead. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, I feel a bit like Fox Mulder, really. You know, you know mm-hmm. how Fox Mulder is always yeah. looking for the looking for the one thing that you know that uh, is, it never finds. It. I'm I'm always, I suppose, since that time, I've always been looking for the, a similar incident that's just as good as that one. And I can't say I've actually found it, to be honest. But that was amazing. I didn't know what to make of it. Um, I just burst into tears, although I wasn't frightened. It was very emotional. Uh-huh. My sister was terrified. We jumped into, I had my dad's car, so we jumped into my dad's car, um, took Nick and Felicity and me and my sister went round to my parents' house. It was now about two o'clock in the morning. And you can imagine my parents weren't best pleased. But the next next day we phoned my friends, and my friend Steve said, look, I don't know what this is, but I have a next-door neighbour who, who might, he's a medium. His name's Keith Hudson. Why don't you come round and tell him? So I, I went round there and this, I mean, we were 19, so Keith was about 27 then. And um, I thought he was a very strange guy. Um, he <laughs> came and said, uh, oh, well, what you saw was her, her spirit guide. It was probably protecting her from, from, from presumably from me. Um, and I thought, well, I don't, I don't buy this. Um, I thought it must be a hallucination. Right. But then again, my, sis, my sister saw it. Right. So if that's a hallucination, we shared it, which means telepathy is real. Now, I was a medical student. This was 1974. I mean, the people had just finished landing on the moon. I was really into science, and I was in a really double bind here because whatever explanation I would come up with, it didn't fit in with science. No. With science as I was talking. It's either telepathy is real or Keith was right. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I just shoved it to one side and didn't know what to do with it. You, you hide these things off, don't you? you think, yes. Okay. Um, um, and that... The, the last time I saw Keith was at Steve's wedding. It was 1976. Um, you know, didn't think anything of it. And then life went on. Um, I qualified as a doctor, got into practice. I and mean, medicine's very busy. And um, I got married and had kids and got into practice, became a partner in a practice. And then, um, how old was I? Uh, this was 2003. I was probably 47. And um, I had a very difficult family situation. Um and basically, I'm a good Jewish boy who didn't break from his mother. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it took me 47, the age 47, to make a break from his mother, really, I think, really. Um, so I came from a, a, a caring family, but everybody was sort of in everybody else's business. And eventually, it, it became a bit too controlling. And when I made a break for freedom, I, um, I got cast out of my immediate family. So I fell out with wow. my parents and my sister. Um, and and then realized, actually, I come from a very large sort of Jewish immigrant family. My, my family came over from Eastern Europe at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and, and what really got me going was that at the time, there was the Kosovan conflict. And um, I saw this, one of my patients, I saw this, this woman who'd had a terrible time in Kosovo. And she came with, a, with her, I, mean, I think she'd been raped. And she came with this little, little girl in her hand. And I remember looking at this little girl, three-year-old little girl. I suddenly realized that she could be my grandmother, you know, mm-hmm. that my family had gone through this a similar situation, you know, with the, the pogroms in Eastern Europe and uh, the ethnic cleansing of the Jews in East, Eastern Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. And I suddenly had this realization that actually something had happened in my family and that what I was experiencing with my parents might well be an echo of the trauma that was in the family. Um, and I come from a quite large family. I have lots of cousins. And I, and I, so I had a chat with my cousins and I realized that they'd all had the same difficulties I'd had. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm a family physician. I deal with these sort of problems. Um, and I traced it down to my grandfather, the, the, the man I'd never met. He was my mother's father. And he'd done very well. He, he was a baker in the East End of London and would have been very successful, but for the fact that he had a gambling habit. So he'd take money out the till and, my grandmother, who I, again, I'd never met her, she died before I was born, would never know whether she was coming or going with the money. And I think that that's a thing that 
that led to men having to be controlled in my family. So anyway, I try to psychoanalyze my family and don't try this at home, folks. It doesn't work. <laughs> and no. that's, that, that's where it all blew up in my face. And, you know, there are certain stones they didn't want to be un, um, uh, overturned. So um, there I was feeling pretty miserable. Um, and then I'm in my surgery. At the, uh, sorry, what, what we call a surgery in this country is what you call a, um, a clinic. Okay. Uh, I'm, so, so surgery can mean it can be a doctor's premises. It can mean uh, a clinic. Um, and it can also mean operating or something. So I'm at the end of my morning surgery, it's my morning clinic. And my last patient is a guy called Keith Bishop. Now, I'd known Keith for many years. Um, he uh, used to be a security guard at BBC Television House in London. And um, he came from a, a working class background like me. And he'd had a few similar problems in as much as that he'd, he'd done very well. He'd left the BBC... Um, having uh, met lots of very famous people. Um, his job at the BBC was to sort of shepherd people in and out and look after them and make sure they were okay. And they liked him, so he had a pocketbook full of famous names. And eventually they asked him to do things for him, and he, and he set up a public relations firm and became very successful. And he felt a little bit out of his depth, but I mean, and we used to have a talk about these things. Um, so I knew him really, really very well mm -hmm. and um, helped him with a few problems. And um, so... So the thing about Keith was he could be a bit unreliable. So he sometimes make an appointment because his, his professional life was so busy. Sometimes he didn't turn up or he was late. So he was, he was the last patient booked for the morning. And um, he, was, he hadn't turned up. So I was just about to sort of go out and do my morning home visits and hopefully go for a swim. Um, and I tried to get up out of my desk. Uh, uh, I tried to stand up from, uh, from behind my desk, but I felt I couldn't. I kept like, feeling something was trying to push me down. And then the phone rang. And it was my receptionist, Carol, who said, look, uh, Mr. Bishop's PA has just phoned. He's at the local station. He's going to be a bit late. He's on his way. So I said, OK, I'll wait, but I'm not going to wait all, all day. <laughs> so Keith, Keith comes in red faced and puffing. Um, and you know, oh, I'm terribly sorry, doctor. I'm really sorry to keep you waiting. And the thing is, I had to take his blood pressure. So, so he needed time to settle down. Um, and what Keith does, he normally, to, when you meet him, fills, fills you in with the latest show. But he's gossip. He's very entertaining. <laughs> So I let him have a chat, and um, then suddenly he looked at me and looked at me quizzically and said, um, I'm really sorry, Doc, but I've got this man here. He says he's the grandfather you've never met, and he wants to speak to you. And I thought, what? Wow. Now, Keith didn't know anything about my background. Certainly didn't know about my grandfather. I certainly didn't know that I was thinking about my grandfather, the one I'd never met. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that Keith um, had, the, you know, did anything like this. I thought Keith had gone mad. In fact, I thought that I was going to have to get him um, uh, sent to a psychiatric unit, <laughs> which would really, really screw up his damn mind because it takes about a couple of hours to sort out. So um, I said, what do you mean? He said, I've, I've always seen spirit. I said, spirit? What do you mean by spirit? I mean, you've always seen spirits? Yeah, I've always seen spirits. Um, I said, well, you've never told me that, Keith, before. He said, well, it's not the sort of thing you tell your doctor because they probably think you're mad. I thought, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Actually, absolutely, yeah. He said, but look, listen, it's really important. I wouldn't tell you otherwise, but it's, this guy's just insisting he comes through. Um, so I said, oh, all right, okay, let's see where this goes. Um, I was intrigued because I've been thinking about my grandfather. Sure. So um, he says, look, he's going to he's gonna sort of come through me. I'm not going to go into a trance or anything, but I'll listen to him and I'll tell you what he's saying. If there's anything he says you don't like, it, it's, not, it's not from me, Doc. I just want you to know that it's from him. Okay. So he seemed to sort of shift gear and got a sort of far away look in his eye. And for the next 20 minutes or so, 20, 30 minutes or so, proceeded to tell me everything about what I'd gone through, what was happening in my family, um, told me everything would be all right in the future. And I, I, my, I mean, my jaw hit the floor. It was absolutely incredible. And after a while, he seemed to sort of come around and said, what did I say? Was that okay? And I said, Keith, that was amazing. Um, I said, um, how long have you been doing this? He said, well, I've, I've done it for many years, but I keep it close to, my, close to myself. It's not the sort of thing you tell people. So. Sure. Anyway, so that, that was very intriguing. And he's, um, I didn't know what to, what to make of it. He left my room. I took his blood pressure eventually. And um, my receptionist knocked on the, on the door a bit gingerly. He said, Ian, are you okay? Because you've been in, in with Mr. Bishop Frazier. I said, yeah, I've just had this really weird experience. I told her. And she said, oh, that's interesting. I like watching Most Haunted on TV, which was a... Um, uh, it's like a TV 
TV program at the time mm -hmm. where they go into haunted houses and have a medium. And I didn't know, really know a lot about it. So I, 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 you know, I thought, well, that's interesting. But things happened pretty quickly after that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think when this happened. Like, Keith, would, that would have been in July. The next, I mean, that, that unsettled me. So the next thing that happened to me was I started having odd dreams. And um, I mean, dreams are pretty boring when you know, people do talk about their dreams. But this was a really weird one. So I was, I was in, in my dream. <clears throat> I was at my, um, my aunt's uh, house at, at the dinner table. She'd have, a big, she'd have big dinner parties. I remember that in the dream I was sitting at this table and um, my cousin Carol, who's a psychotherapist, in the dream was trying to get me to do a chest x-ray on one of her clients. And I was trying to fend her off in my dream. And then in the dream, I heard myself saying, and I'm not psychic and I can't see auras. Hmm. And in the dream, to my left, I heard this voice in a Cockney accent saying, of course you can, boss, I'll show you. And I, in the dream, I turned to the left. And at the end of this table was a, a short, dumpy Indian, not, not an American Indian, but an Indian guy mm -hmm. um, with a, a, a Cockney flat cap on. Um, and um, above him on the wall behind him was like a wall light. And with that, he turns around and flicks a switch on the wall. And all these colours came out of the light. And the predominant colour was this amazing blue. And he says to me in the dream, what do you do with all that, with all that blue? Uh, in the dream, I say, as if I'd already, always known, but just temporarily forgotten, oh, I give it to people. And I just woke up in tears. I didn't know what the dream was about. I remember waking my wife up, saying, I've just had this amazing dream. I think I'm going mad. And so she, she said... You've always been a bit mad, but don't worry about it. I'm, I'm still with you. <laughs> so I knew that whatever's happening, that she'd still be with me. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that, that was odd. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, why was talking about auras and psychic stuff in dreams? I mean, it, it was just crazy. But yes. Um, and then, um, the so that must have been about beginning of August. Now, in the middle of August, um, the um, school high school exams come out. So my son, Josh, was... Uh, uh, 16 at the time. He'd just done his high school exams, what we call GCSEs in this country, and they're, they're released in the middle of August. Um, so the plan, and it's on a Thursday, so the, the plan was that I would go into work on Thurs that Thursday, and I'd come home for lunch where I could be with Josh when he got his exam results. Mm -hmm. um, so in this country, we do a lot of home visits, and you normally do your morning clinic and then do your home visits afterwards. So I thought I'd do my home at see check the home visit book and see if any visits had come through before my clinic started. So I went in early. Um, and sure enough, there was a visit in the book, and it was within walking distance from my clinic. So I thought I'd just um, I, I'd leave my car in the car park. I, I'd put my car keys on my desk. And I thought I'd just go out before my clinic started, do that, and then get back mm -hmm. and then get home quickly. And so I flung my keys on my desk. And as I left, to leave the room, I felt this blow to the back of my head, a physical blow, and I heard a voice behind me saying, pick up your car keys or they'll get stolen. And I just remember thinking, that's crazy, you know, I must have imagined it. Left my room, um, and because I was anxious about Joshua's um, exam results, I went to the wrong house. <laughs> so, <laughs> so eventually I found the right house and um, got back just, just in time to start my clinic. And as I got back to my uh, to the health centre, my receptionist Anne said, "Ian, um, what car have you got?" And I told her what car I had. Uh, it was a blue car. She said, "We just chased two boys out of out of the car. We we think they got your car key out of your room, and they've run off. And we think they've taken the car key." And I said, "Oh, I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen." She said, "Why? Why?" She said, "Why the bloody hell didn't you pick up your car key?" Exactly. Then? I said, "Because I'm stupid." Anyway, <laughs> so so. And then, sure enough, they luckily they'd just taken my car key. They hadn't taken the other keys that were on the key ring, and that was the surgery keys and my house keys. So um, that's amazing. So I had a I had a clinic full of of patients, and um, my car they they'd run off my car. Now there were drugs in my car and prescription pads and stuff, um, and I and control drugs. So I didn't know you know like morphine and stuff. So I didn't know what they'd taken. So. Um, it was imperative I got in there. So I had to report it to the police. And the police weren't answering the phone. And the police station is just across the road. So I'm getting increasingly agitated and upset. So I thought, you know what, I'm so upset. I think I'll just um, 
freeze the surgery, tell everyone to wait, and I'll go across the road at, into the police station. Now, this police station was, uh, you know, they're, they're not, they're not, police station not very nice places. The last time I, I, I went to the police station, it was, um, you had to sort of uh, press a buzzer on the door and be let in, and then there was another door, and there was this sort of CCTV camera looking at you, and these are, you know, these rather beefy looking policemen behind staring at you. Huh. So I thought, okay, I, I go go to the police station and the doors open and it's obviously been downgraded. It's not so such a secure place anymore. And there's no policeman there, but there's a civilian police officer. The, in, the Metropolitan, London Metropolitan Police, the, the, the civilian uh, guys behind the desk, they, they have different uniforms. So I knew he wasn't a policeman. And uh, he was sitting, so there was like a counter and behind the counter was an, an, another desk, and he was sitting at this other desk with a woman who looked like his secretary, and they were, they were looking at a computer screen. Um, so I went up to the counter, and there was there was one of my patients, in fact, was was in front of me at the counter. And when he saw me, he sort of um, took took off his t-shirt, show, showed me his torso that was covered in bruises, and said, "Look what the look what the bastard did to me." Um, oh, no, you know, <laughs> he'd been in a oh. fight. He was always in fights. So mm-hmm. I, I don't need this anyway. So. Eventually, he'd been processed, and it was my turn. And um, the guy behind the desk said, look, I'm really sorry, but we've got this new computer system. It's, it's very slow. Um, and I'm thinking, look, and I've got a waiting room full of p- patients. Please, just I just need you to sort of process it. I needed what was called a crime reference number so I could tell my insurance company so they could then change, uh, change the locks on my car. Um, so he said, I'll need your, your, your date of birth. So I gave it to him. And he said, oh, you're a Leo like me. And... Um, I thought, that's a funny thing for him to say. And I said, are you into all this new age stuff? Um, and he said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually um, a, a psychiatric nurse at the local hospital. And I'm just filling in here. I'm doing a degree in spirituality. Hmm. And um, I'm just doing this part time. I said, oh, well, you might be interested to know that I, I knew my cars. My car was going to be broken into. And, and then I realized that actually he'd festooned the walls with sort of um, religious paintings like the sort of things ki- kids would draw, like um, uh, stars and fairies and angels, uh, but from all different faiths. Um, and, and there were like three little Buddhas on the counter. I, I remember thinking, this is very odd. This is not the police station I remember. And I, and I felt like I was sort of going into the twilight zone. And, and, and as, as I was feeling that, he said, look, I think we were meant to meet. I'll give you a reading. And with that, he sort of took out from his desk some Native uh, American... Uh, medicine cards <laughs> right then and there in the police station in the police station. oh my goodness so so, so um, he said look he spread them out on the counter and said look just pick a card and um, see no, he said think of a question in your mind and then pick a card and then we'll see what that means so um, the question in my mind was was my software going to be successful because I was really into my software project then so um, I picked the card up he looked at it um, consulted his little book that came with it and he said, um, the, the, he said, the book says the world is not yet ready. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, probably not. I said, can I have my crime reference number now? He said, yes. So I left the police station and I had this really weird feeling that if I'd have gone back in there, he, I finally, he wasn't there and there'd just be policemen there. I felt like I slipped into sort of a different sort of uh, parallel universe for a while. Sure. So I, I, I get back to my, my health centre and I, I tell the receptionist, and they all start whisting the twilight zone. <laughs> thing. <laughs> funny no so but but the interesting thing was is that happened um the the day i was really quite anxious about my son's um exam results and i noticed that actually subsequently that whenever um i'm going through a period in my life where there's a lot of anxiety or or high energy Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be anxiety it could even be extreme happiness it seems to be a high energy state that's when these these things happen If if i'm feeling low or tired tends not to happen. So I just that's throw that with that out there. That's something I've noticed. It's really years. good to know. Yes. Yeah. For all of us. That's it. Yeah. Well that that makes me think there's a process going on and mm-hmm. it requires energy. Anyway, so um the, the the next day we had to go to a party. And um at the party, the very first person I met at this party was um a woman who started telling me that she'd grown up in a haunted house with poltergeists. I remember saying to my wife, look I've had enough of this. I'm I'm just going. You you you, you speak to her, I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> it's so all went, over, right? Yeah, so Everywhere you go. To get a, absolutely. Went into the kitchen to get a drink. And this house is a big house, had another garden. So I went out into this smaller garden, and in this garden was my another cousin sitting on a swing bench. 
distant relation. I didn't know her very well. And, uh, and I heard, as I walked in, into that garden, she, I heard her saying, I used to be a spiritual healer, but I had to give it up when the kids were born. I remember stopping, thinking, saying to Rose, what's going on here? She said, why? I said, I keep on bumping into this. And she looked at me and sort of said, well, that's easy, Ian. They want to work with you. I said, who? She said, the spirits. Hmm. Um, she actually said spirit. I didn't know what spirit meant. I said, spirit? She said, yeah. You know, she said, when, when people die, they say they're doctors and nurses, um, if they find someone who's up for it, then they'll, they'll try and work with you and they're trying to let you know that they want to work with you. And I just said, look, this is just crazy. You know, um, you can believe what you want. Um, more stuff started happening. I can't remember it now, but there are lots okay. of little things. Um, so if, eventually, I, I, it was, it was, someone was trying to grab my attention. That's exactly what it felt. I was going mad or someone was trying to grab my attention. Yes. Um, I didn't think I was going mad because these things, my wife was, you know, real, think, you know we were together when something started happening. So I had a chat with one of my patients, a guy called Dave Godfrey. Now, Dave was um, an ex-science teacher, very sensible guy, and he's, he became a, a spiritual healer. Um, hmm. he's, he's done his time in the sweat lodges. He, he drums the, uh, the sun up at the winter solstice at Stonehenge. Um, he's a nice guy and uh, very sensible. So I said to him, look, what's going on? And he said, oh, yeah, you know, he said, um, I firmly believe that there's a spiritual dimension to life. And um, and that they um, they want to work with you. I said, well, who are these spirits? He said, well, you know, it depends who you want to work with. They could be spiritual animals, spirit totems. They may be de- deceased relatives. He says, there's a whole universe out there that you're not aware about. He then explained to me about the idea of um, the chakras. He explained it really well as a flow of energy, um, subtle energy from the ethereal realms to the physical realm and then back like an energy flow. Mm-hmm. It, it made a bit of sense. And he, I, I said, well, you know, how do I get, he said, Ian, you need to get a handle on this. If you don't, it'll drive you crazy. So I said, well, well, how do I do this? He said, well, you need to join a development circle. I said, well, where are they? He said, well, they're in spiritualist churches. So I said, now, listen, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not religious. I'm, I come from a, 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 an atheistic Jewish family. Mm-hmm. Um, and my wife's Hindu. We don't go to church. And he said, well, if spirit want to work with you, they'll find a way. And that was it. And the next day, my wife was reading the local newspaper, and there was a little small ad for the, uh, which, for the Beacon of Light Spiritualist Church, which is a local spiritualist church. And she said, Ian, look who's giving a talk there. And it was Keith Hudson. Oh, who was the guy. yes. He said, she said, that's, she, because she, she knew Keith. She, didn't, she hadn't met Keith, but she'd heard me talk about Felicity's face, Felicity's face ad nauseum. I mean, over the over the years you know she says you've told that to everybody um so she said we've got to go so i said i'm not going to to a spiritual church and she said no we must go so i thought okay we'll go so we went and i sat at the back of the church of course. <laughs> trying to make myself inconspicuous mm-hmm. yeah so so keith was there and and to be honest he looked pretty much the same as he did i mean he'd lost his hair very young so he looked pretty much the same when Keith last saw me, I had a beard and thick, dark, curly hair, and I've lost my hair now. So I didn't, I don't, I, there's no way he would have recognized me. But the very first time Keith met me, he said, Ian, you've got a lot, when I was a medical student, he said, Ian, you've got a lot of knowledge around you. You don't know you know it, but you will one day. And I thought, well, that's a safe bet. I'm a medical student, you would say that. Sure. So we're in this, we're in this British this church, and he's giving a message to everybody at a fair clip. And then he comes to me, he says, sir, you have a lot of knowledge around you. You don't know you know it but they're telling me that you will very soon and you're going to be writing a book about it. Hmm. I thought, well, I bet he says that to everyone because, you know, he said it to me when he first met me. He said it again. Actually, he doesn't. He doesn't. So anyway, so at the end of the um, the service, the president of the church stood up and said, um, Mr. Hudson hasn't got a car. Can anyone give him a lift uh, to, his, to Walthamstow, which is the next borough east from where I am? So I stood up and said, yeah, yeah, I'll give him a lift, um, but only, only if he comes back to my house for a cup of tea first. So he, he, he took a, a step backwards because there are some strange people at spiritualist service. Yes. But when I said, Keith, it's me, Ian, Ian, the doctor. And he said, oh, Ian. He said, I was just talking about you the other day. So he came back to my house and we, we sort of reconnected after, well, 30 years or so. Wow. Um, and um, I took him back to, to Walthamstow and he said, Ian, I, I serve Walthamstow, Walthamstow Spiritualist Church. I'm, um, and we have the largest open circle in North London. 
you don't have to be a church member or a spiritualist to, to join why don't you come so i did so february t- 2004 i joined much to my surprise um the development circle um in Warmerstow. um and then that that's how i started training as a medium incredible yeah i mean i, I actually felt that i was sort of um forced into it <laughs> didn't have a choice really do you have a, um, a story or a uh, of um, one of the first few times that you actually saw someone and someone said, yes, I, you know, I can take that. That's so-and-so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, first of all, remember, it hadn't really impacted on my professional life then. Right. So, I was, so we used to meet every Thursday amongst people from actually the, I mean, I'm a doctor, so sort of middle class profession. But um, I, actually, I grew up, I come from a working class family. Um from a borough very close to North London uh, called Tottenham, um, which is very close to Walthamstow. My cousins grew up in that area. It was very much like I was recapitulating my family life. So these were amongst working class, sort of the earth people, sort of people I was, I, I, I'd grown up with. Um, so I immediately felt at home, um, um, but they, they thought it was hilarious because um, I had great difficulty doing the exercises because I was always thinking and my critical mind would get in the way. So instead of just accepting um, and letting my intuition work, I'd always be overanalyzing, which actually impaired the process. But so it took me a long time, and I was a bit like the dunce of the class, really. But <laughs> um, so the the so at, and that, the interesting thing was at the time Keith was using um, a number technique to give messages to people. So so the idea was is that we'd um, we sit in circle, we'd we'd meditate, we'd open up to spirit by a series of meditation exercises. And then we'd, um, we'd try and give messages to each other. And the idea was just to clear your mind and hook the first image that came into your mind and see what it meant to you. This is something which is completely different uh, to, to the way you're tra- trained as a doctor, where you're taught to analyze. Right. I found these exercises really, really difficult. Um, um, and so, but instead of picking on one person saying, I'm gonna give you a message, we would have to give the message to a number. So let's say there were 20 people in the circle. Um, Keith would, in his mind, pick on one person and say that person is number one and then go clockwise or anti-clockwise around the circle. So everyone would be given a number, but he, but he wouldn't tell us what those numbers were and he wouldn't tell us who the person he was, uh, he was picking on was first. So we had no clue who the numbers belonged to. But he assured us that his spirit guide would have a chat with our spirit guide, which sounded crazy to me, and that they'd sort the numbers out. So all we had to do was think of a number and get, and then think of a message or an image that would relate to that number. So it, it, it was a bit like um, the old fashioned stock exchange where everyone's calling because we'd, we'd all start um, thinking of numbers and thinking of messages. And we'd call it out to Keith and he'd sort of sit in the dark and have like a Harry Potter illuminated pen. <laughs> which is sort of, so you can see what he was writing and he say oh hang on a minute right number one right yeah so and so's um ian's giving a message for number one and jenny's giving a message for number it's number one then he so he'd have these these messages so i might give two or three messages for different numbers and, and that the but i didn't know who the messages were for and at the end of the session he he'd then crack the code and say okay so and so was number one and i started round circle so he then go through each number in turn and say who they were for and then um, get you to say, Ian, give your message to whoever number one was, because now we know who they were. Um, which was interesting, and often they could take the message. But more intriguing was that I find I would track the same person from week to week, even though the number would change from, from week to week. So, um, say Jenny might be number one one week, she might be number four one week, number 11 another week, but, but, but I would always give her a message. And then when I finished giving her messages, then I go on to somebody else. And I couldn't work out how that was happening because you'd expect it to be random, you know. Exactly, charms. sure. Um, and the other thing was is the messages were often well taken. I mean, um, the first message I gave was to actually Jenny, and I think it was number four. She was number four that week. And um, I saw this guy with sort of um, uh, greased black black hair and a, a little moustache, and, um, and the message was... Uh, check the holiday arrangements so i gave her that message and she said well you've described my uncle george he always comes through when i get a message which was interesting in itself i don't know what the um message is the next week when 
the circle reconvene she said I, i'll tell you what the message was um i booked my ho- holiday on the internet and um uh i i, I put the wrong details of my credit card in and it hadn't actually gone through uh-huh. so thank you for that so that was interesting sure um another one that came to mind was a guy called joe he was number 11 that week and i'd seen this um this uh, image of a of a, a miner and he was sort of pointing to a hole in the ground and laughing and um it turned out that day yeah well that da- well i said and when and joe immediately took it he said yeah my, my patio just collapsed into a sinkhole <laughs> yeah uh in the garden that day so yeah that was yeah i can take that message that was pretty pretty good um and that that, that was really that was really interesting um so that they were the first messages that, and they were they were good enough for me to think well there's something going there's on something here something happening yeah. yeah and the fact that it was sort of wasn't given directly so I, I couldn't get clues or visual cues as to who it was it was really quite scientific it's what's called in the in medicine be called a single blind trial in, in as much as Keith knew the code but we didn't a oh. double blind tri- trial is what you do for drugs is when no one knows what the code is and the code's cracked at the end so that was pretty good I mean, it's pretty scientific, really. Yeah. Um, and then it started to impinge on my professional life when um, the very first first time was actually at the end of a surgery, um, at the end of a circle, um, Mary came up to me. She said, I've got this German soldier in Second World War uniform. And she described him, very impatient, tapping his foot behind you. Can you take him? And I said, well, bearing in mind my background, I think it's highly unlikely that I'd have a Second World War German exactly. soldier attached to me. Although, but though I did think that my, my cousin Lottie, um, she was German. She got out on the, the last kinder transport. I wondered if it was for her. But then I realised that I had this patient called Ellie, Ellie Richardson, who was actually German in origin. She was actually at the bombing of Hamburg. And after the war, she married one of the British occupying forces, a guy called Tony, Tony Richardson. And he brought her over to, to London. And she was my patient and I got on with Ellie very, very well. And I did think, oh, I wonder if it's for Ellie. Um, I thought I must go and tell her, but it was like nine o'clock on a February evening and you don't want your, <laughs> how would you feel if a doctor turned up saying, I've got this message for you, Ellie. A little strange, a um, little strange. A little strange. So I sort of um, curbed my enthusiasm, but as luck would have it, or maybe not luck, um, I, uh, I started my clinic at 8.30 the next morning and she was the very first person Hmm. very first person on the list and I thought um, I really 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 wish um, that um, I knew what this guy's name was and um, as um, as I thought that I um, I heard a voice in my mind saying Helmholtz and um, I thought oh, I wonder maybe I'm just making it up so I um, I called her in to my room and uh, I wanted to give her this message but I didn't know well, it wasn't really a message just to say that, that this uh, this guy had been hanging around me I didn't know how to say it mm-hmm. so um, I hummed and hard and I said um, oh I, I met a medium last night and she immediately brightened up and said um, oh yes I'm ever since Tony died uh, her husband um, I've been seeing uh, a medium and I found it very helpful I'm really into that so I thought oh that's okay I said actually I got this this message last night and I wondered if it was for you and I described this this soldier and she said that sounds like um how uh, a, a guy I used to my boyfriend his um surname was Helmholtz no so uh, yeah 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 and I thought you know um you know what I thought at the time I I thought I was damn I wish I'd given her the name first exactly <laughs> yeah because um you know what you know part of the mediumship is there's always a bit of one-upmanship isn't there and I was getting really quite into it then I was thinking ah yeah I should have given her the name um, so that was intriguing, but it really wasn't um, my message. I mean, it was given to me, um, and it, and so it hadn't really sort of impacted on my 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 work life. But um, pretty much soon after that, um, it, weird stuff starts to happen at work. Well, I mean, by weird stuff, I mean I started to get messages through when I was with patients, um, and that's when it starts to get a little bit. Um, I started to worry about it a bit because. Um, but I, I want to tell you the first time it happened. So I was um, seeing this this disabled lady with her carer in my room, and uh, I was um, examining her, and I as, and the carer was sitting to my right. So the, 
just just to my right, some of my right shoulder. So, um, as I um, was speaking to my the disabled lady, I kept on being drawn to her care her caregiver, and my my neck was turning around, and I kept on having these images in my mind of um, of uh, flowers and uh, purple ribbons. And um, I felt that she'd lost her mother. So I said, uh, have you lost your mother? She said, no. She said, but I've lost a lady who was like my mother. I said, mm. Oh, okay. Sorry. And then I turned back to my patient. And then I, did, and then I said, um, excuse me, did, I, have you been dealing with flowers? She said, yes, I've been doing the flowers at the funeral. Fine, thank you. Turned back to my patient. I said, then I said, um, um, have you been dealing with purple ribbons? She said, I've been winding purple ribbons around the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then I said, okay, fine. And then I thought I'm going to get on with my job. And then I felt myself being drawn back to her because I'd seen this Siamese cat with the most beautiful eyes. I said, did she have a cat? She said, yeah, she had a Siamese cat. Oh, no. Wow. Yeah. I said, oh, okay. And then then, and then, then it stopped. And um, so I, I did, did my job. And, and then the caregiver got up and to help her, 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 her charge out of the room. And at the door, she said, she said, Doctor, are you psychic? I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. I thought, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, uh, um, but so, so that that happened. But the, I, I managed to conceal it. But the very first time it really, really happened and had an impact was with my patient Lucy, and her name's Lucy, uh, Lucy Christosterman. She doesn't mind me g- giving her name because she wants me to use her name because she really like like likes what happened. So, I'd known Lucy for quite a few years and she's a bright bubbly lady and she was she was 66 years old then and um this was on the 6th of december 2004 i think yeah and um so she came into my room and she was just in floods of tears i mean she could not stop crying i'd never seen her like that before and um i think i mean i didn't know why she didn't know why and um after 15 minutes scratching my head, I decided that I, she, I, her saying, you've got to help me, you've got to help me. I decided the only thing I could do was to give her an antidepressant. So uh, I, I, uh, pres- as, as the prescription came out my printer, as I drew it out my printer, I felt a blow to the back of my head, just like with the key incident, mm-hmm. and heard a voice behind me saying, ask her about her father. And with that, over her left shoulder, I could actually see the misty outline of a man who I could describe. So I heard myself saying, Lucy, tell me about your dad. And she stopped crying, looked at me sort of strangely and said, he was killed 38 years ago on the 8th of December, which would have been the two days time in the anniversary, because that was the 6th of December that mm-hmm. happened, um, by the IRA. Do you think that's why I'm depressed? And I said, um, and dis- I said, do you look like and describe the man over her shoulder? She said, yes, how do you know? I said, uh, Lucy, I think I can see him over your left shoulder. At which point she, she leapt at me, grabbed my arm and said, thank you, doctor, you don't know how, what this means to me. And wow. the story goes that she was in, I mean, she was from rural Ireland. Poor family, and like a lot of rural Irish, she'd gone to England um, to make earn a living. And she was 16 and she was in um, working in Manchester. And she, at the time, the troubles in Northern Ireland were, were starting, in Ireland were starting off. And um, although she was Catholic, her father didn't like what the IRA were doing. And he was found uh, tarred, feathered and kneecapped and oh. in, a, in, a, in a ditch. So she'd always assumed it was the IRA. Um, uh, and she'd always felt that her, hu- that her father was around her. But when she told the family, um, they said, well, you know, we're not meant to believe this. Um, so, so and you're stupid, you know, you've got to stop thinking like this. So, she, of course, she hadn't realised it was the anniversary of his death. And when I pointed out that I'd seen the, uh, her father, this immediately, she realised what the cause of her suffering was. And she stopped crying and said, oh, now I know why I'm depressed. I don't need your pills. Thank you, doctor, and left my room. Wow. And I, I thought, God, what have I done? And she then went outside and had a chat, uh, spent half an hour speaking to my receptionist, Carol, saying what an amazing reading I'd given her. And then a month a month later, she came back to see me, all smiles. So I said, hello, Lucy, what's wrong? She said, nothing. So I said, well, why are you here then? So she sat herself down in my seat, smiling, and said, I've come to tell you a story. And the story is that two weeks after that, after I'd given her the message, she'd gone to an Irish social do, and this uh, creepy guy 
who's known to have the second sight, had been tugging at her coattails in the corridor, um, saying, Lucy, Lucy, I've got a message for you. Come into this room. Um, and she said, well, if you've got a message for me, I'm not coming to any room with you. you. You give it here. And he said, do you know there's a man over your left shoulder? I think he's your father. And she said, well, of course I do. My doctor told me that two weeks ago. <laughs> and she said, she said, you know what, Doc? That sure took the wind out of his sails. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I thought that was that. And so she come back to tell me, you know, and give me proof. So um, that's how. And then, of course, word started spreading that I was doing this um, with my patients. And um, that's how I got to the point where I am now. Wow. Are you good to talk for a few more minutes? I know I said yeah, yeah, about yeah, an yeah, hour, but... Yeah, no, not as long. I'm sorry. It took a while to get there. So Yeah, that's okay. I just I don't want to rush you, and I have yeah. time if you have time to speak. Yeah, I've got lots of time, Sandra. Yeah, this lots is of time. fascinating. So many years have passed since those first things happened. Well, yeah, but, but then I had to deal with then I had to deal with the with with the concept of spirit guides. Okay. So um, I mean, if, if, remember my, I'm a doctor, and I'm, yes. tra- I'm and I'm trained to think logically and to accept science. And though I've got an open mind. I've got, everyone's got their boggle threshold. And I was co- crossing my boggle threshold. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's a boggle. So I'd reached my boggle threshold, but there was another one. And the next boggle threshold is spirit guides, okay. right? Because once you start dealing with this stuff, you inevitably have to deal with spirit guides, right? Right. Um, um, spiritualists believe in them. And I mean, once you get into this, you inevitably deal with spirit guides. And, um, and I had a great deal of difficulty believing in spirit guides. This was the next sticking point for, for me. Um, and um, it took me a long time to accept the fact, okay, maybe I have got spirit guides. I mean, I couldn't just, I found it very hard to imagine there'd be someone hanging around me, helping me. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, could they see, you know, everything about my life, even the private stuff? Also, wouldn't they be bored? And how does it work anyway? Yes. Um, so uh, the, actually the best explanation when I was having a chat with my guy, when I got into it was my guy said to me, look, I'm always in the back of your mind and you're always in the back of my mind. And that's as simple as that. And if you need me, you know, we can talk, you know, like this, simple as that, um, which makes sense really. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah. But I mean, I, I mean, I won't go into details now, but I mean, the guys have to prove themselves. And I had a series of very odd coincidences. Um, I mean, stunning, stunning coincidences. Um, well, all right, I'll tell one story. Okay. I mean, it's me, it involves me and Angelina Jolie, although she doesn't know it. Um, <laughs> so, but so actually, it's a really good story. So, um, the very first guide I met, well, actually, this, this is the second guide. I won't talk about my first guide. But the very first, this is a good story. So, I'll tell this. So, I've got two guides. Um, um, and this, so I, I, um, in my clinic one day, and I, feel this presence behind me and I sense this tall African guy behind me and in my head I'm saying who are you he said I, I'm your African guide what's your name he said call me Koza so I'm in front of my computer I type in K-O-S-A into the computer don't get anything but I get X-H-O-S-A which is Koza which is a South African tribe um, you may not have heard of them but um, two very famous people Kozas are um, Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Mm, okay. So they're from the uh, East Cape. Actually, it's Oza. It's actually a click sound. It's Oza, but we'd say Koza. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I said, okay, that's your tribal name. Yeah. Um, what's your real name? He said, just call me Koza. So um, I said, okay, I'm not sure. I'm thinking this is just a part of me, really, you know, just I'm. Um, just fantasizing here. Imagination, maybe it's a part. Play. Maybe it's my yeah. Maybe it's my unconscious mind, and maybe I need to separate it off so I can go off and do the psychic stuff, and allowing my you know so I can split it in some way so it's not too difficult for me to cope with. Um, so so um, I'm sitting in my lounge, the lounge I'm sitting in now actually at home, and um, at the time we had a VHS. Um, with a VHS tape, and um, there's a tape on top of the VHS recorder, which had been there for about a year. My son Paul had recorded it, and it, and it was Lara Croft and the Cradle of Life, and everyone had gone to bed, and I was sitting thinking about my spirit guide, Koza, and I thought, you know what, I'll just watch a film. So I thought, well, oh, that, that's been on, on the top of the uh, VCR for ages. Let's see what it's like. And I was watching it, and um, halfway through I got a bit bored. It's a kid's film. 
and um, my mind started drifting off to my my psychic stuff, which was occupying my mind a lot. And and how come mere doctor is in, is is um, uh, interacting with voices in my head, which is very very strange. Mm-hmm. Um, and who is this guy Koza anyway? And with that, Angelina Jolie um, as Lara Croft on the on the TV screen picks up the phone and says. Tell uh, tell Coz tell Coza to meet me north of his village. We're off to Kilimanjaro. And I think what? So I thought I'm going becoming schizophrenic now because I'm now getting messages through my TV. Pause. Rewind. No, she actually did say that. So now I'm really glued to the screen. Absolutely. And then, absolutely. And the next half of the uh, of the story is how her guide Coza. Her African guy, Koza, is leading her across the plains of Kilimanjaro. In the movie. Fighting, in the movie, fighting off evil spirits. In the movie. And I'm thinking, how does this work? That's okay? amazing. Because Paul, my son, had recorded this before I'd got into spiritualism. Right. Right? So, and I, so I go to my circle the next day and say to everyone, you'll never guess what happened to me. How and, and I'm saying, how does it happen? And they're all saying, well, they can do that. Who can do it? The guys can do it. I'm saying, yeah, but how? How can they do it? They, they can do it. Yeah, but how do they do it? I mean, you think, think about it. I mean, they had to audition Angelina Jolie for the movie. <laughs> they had to get the name Koza. They had to, my son Paul had to, I mean, they, they're like, they, and then I had to think about it. They, they, how do you orchestrate that? And manipulate um, time and space to well, it, put exactly. the, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, well, I've got a theory now. But, I mean, at, at the time, it was just, uh, and all, all, all the spirits you could say was, well, they can do that. And, yeah, I mean, they can do that. <laughs> actually, goodness. I think I, I think I now understand how it works. And it actually is it's just a perspective thing, is that everything happens at once out of time. Um, time is an illusion. Um, I mean, the mystical experience is is that there is no time. Right. And everything happens at once. And it's like a... An enormous configuration where everything falls into place. But I mean, I don't know. That's just, oh. just one theory. So but, currently, do your um, patients come to you, or I mean, are you known about town as the psychic oh, yeah. doctor? Well, yeah, because I've got a big mouth. So, um, and I and I'm in, actually I was a bit of a space kid. Is what you? I don't know if you know when you get into this, um, you can lose touch with reality. Yes, I, mean, I do know that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been everybody becomes a space kid at first, you know. Come in planet Earth, you know, Ian's right. leaving Earth. And, you know, you just can't stop talking about it. Uh, you think it's weird. You, like, it, it, these strange coincidences and you're thinking of what the hell's going on. Yes. And I was in that zone. Um, I, I call it the twilight zone. So, and me being me, and I'm quite upfront. And also, remember, I was 47 in a practice, married, secure, safe, yes. um, with a well-established practice, Um I had a lot of support around me with with partners. I mean, my, like you know, colleagues, yes, business partners, um, who who were very supportive. I mean, imagine imagine being in a medical practice, busy National Health Service medical practice, and one of the partners starts saying he's in touch with dead people. I mean, you can imagine that. I mean, <laughs> that could be a career threatening thing. I would I mean, say so. Yes. But first of all, dealing with 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 um, other doctors, and second of all, you know, dealing with the the medical board what we call the General Medical Council in the UK. So, um, I mean, all of this is extremely, uh, you know, you're, you're treading a fine line professionally. Yes. But I've got very, very supportive colleagues. I mean, really supportive colleagues in a practice where we try and nurture each other and let people develop. And um, they obviously thought I wasn't going mad. I wasn't sort of saying, look, you know, you, you got to believe this to people, um, ramming it down their throats. I was really doing it because... In a way that saying, look, I'm not sure this is real, but these are the impressions I'm getting mm-hmm. to patients. And if you find it helpful, um, you might find this helpful. And so, and actually, people would find I pick up things about people, or if they'd lost Pete, lost relatives, I'd find I'd be able to get um, images and messages through. Um, so uh, I started to gradually integrate it into my practice. Um, I mean, we're very busy. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like in the in the US, but we have the National Health Service here. So patients don't pay. I mean, there's no money exchanges. And it's all, it, it's a totally different system we have here, which is lovely. But but you only get about 10-minute appointments with the doctor. So it's all a bit rushed. Um, so, um, but I, somehow or another, I managed to integrate it. Um, 
And um, amazingly, it tends to come through when I'm at my busiest. And I think it's because it's when my conscious mind is distracted. Um, so I'm not overly critical and it sort of sneaks in around the back door, so to speak. So whatever's happening, it uses your intuitive mind. Um, so, so anyway, over the years, I sort of developed that. and I've become quite comfortable with it. My patients have, uh, find it quite com- comfortable and comforting. Absolutely. And it's just something that Dr. Rubenstein does. And um, the only complaint I've had um, was when, because <laughs> you're always worried about someone complaining, you know, that you shouldn't be doing this stuff. And um, yes. then there'd be a hearing. But the only complaint I had was when a woman came to see me about her knee, and I examined her knee and treated her knee, and then she left my room and then complained that I hadn't given a message from her deceased father-in-law, oh. which, she'd, which she'd been hoping. So, which is, which is interesting. So it just goes to show how much, how readily people accept these experiences and how, how, how hard I found it to accept these experiences. What I've learned, um, which has really opened my eyes, is speak is is speak is because once 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 people know that you're open to this, then pa- my patients will start telling me their stories. Yes. And um, what I've learned is that these experiences are really common. Um, that. Oh, Ian, I've lost you. Ian, I will call you back. Not... Oh, I lost you for just a second there. Oh, sorry. You, the last thing I heard you say is these experiences are really common. Yeah, and they're therapeutically very useful. Um, are you there? Yes, I'm, I am. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, yeah, so, so I gradually, gradually, gradually started um, trusting my intuition a bit more. And um, I won't always say, look, I've got a message from so-and-so, because I'm not, a lot of the time, I'm not sure where these messages are coming from. But sometimes what happens is patients will look at me and say, you've got that look in your eye, Doc. <laughs> and, I, and I realize that I have and that, I, that my mind's drifting and they'll say, say, see what you can get. And then I'll, I'll find all this stuff will come through. And once you get one image, more flood through and you can you can firm up a pretty decent message. Um, it's not like I thought it would be. It's not most of the time. It's not like there's someone in the room with you, although on some occasions it is like that. But, um, yeah, it's become quite a useful adjunct to what I do. Um, but I mean, a couple of times I, I have had people come back who, who were like, you know, like they were in the room with me. And there was two patients, one, one, a guy called Brian, who died on the operating table. He was my patient. And when his wife came into my room, Brian would be there. OK, it was I couldn't see him, but I could see him in my head because mm-hmm. I knew the guy, which helped. But he, he would be it's like um, you're in a room with someone and you've got your eyes closed. You know, they're there. His presence was there. And he would give his wife, Linda, the most amazing evidence. Uh, uh, he'd, he'd give me messages uh, telling her how to service the, um, the uh, pump in their garden pond, um, wow. what to do with the garage. Once um, he mentioned the fact that she just bought some sticks. And I said, look, Linda Brian said we just bought sticks. She said, oh. And she took out her shopping list and showed me top of her shopping list with garden canes. And she bought some garden canes and they were in her car. Stuff like that. And, that, and he came back for a year, and um, the evidence was such that she actually wrote to a local um, Fate and Fortune magazine, which is a psychic magazine, mm-hmm. and they did a feature on me about the messages I'd given. Oh, her. congratulations! Have you yeah, picked up was, uh, any? Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, no. Any medical? No. Hints yeah. About, well, like, yeah. But, any of that? Um, I've, I've steered clear of it because I don't want to muddy the waters. A, a couple of things. Um, first of all. Everybody who does this is meant to have a healing guide with them. Um, and I know my healing guide, and I'm quite happy for them to get on and do the work. Um, but oh. I'm, I'm a Western doctor. People come to me for Western medicine. Okay, I do a bit of acupuncture. I do a lot of counseling. But actually, my stocking trade is I'm a Western doctor. Yes. And that's what I practice. Um, I, the thing about mediumship, you give a message, it's, you get instant feedback. It's either right or wrong, and mm-hmm. there's no half measure. I like that. Healing, well... Um, it may or may not work. It's time consuming and you can always say they'd have got better anyway. So I don't dismiss healing, but it's not what I do per se. I mean, I'm sure mediumship, uh, giving a decent message is, is healing in and of itself. No doubt about that. Um, and occasionally I feel moved to sort of uh, just sort of put my hands on people's shoulders and stand behind them for a little while and they find that helpful. But I wouldn't say 
I do spiritual healing as such. It it just hopefully it's happening when I'm if it's real when I'm with patients anyway. Yes. Um, how has it impacted people who are grieving? Well, well, great. I mean, I mean, the the the, the latest one was um, uh, a guy who came to see me. Or rather, uh, so Paul died. He died of lung cancer, and his wife Sue came to see me. And I started. He, and he, I mean, I was giving him message. He came, the minute she came through the door, he was there. Uh, I think it helped. That I knew him, but he he was giving messages stuff I couldn't possibly know to Sue. And she was so impressed that she she brought her stepson um, Danny in. Um, and as Danny walked in through the door, um, Paul was there because so so Paul was Danny's father, but Sue was not Danny's mother. Mm. And um, immediately I started having images of, um, you know, the little security trolleys. You know, when when you're at a, an airport, you have to take all your things off your belt and, yes. and your mobile phone. You put it in these little trays, and they're on mm-hmm. these little roll of things. I saw images of these little tra- these trays on these roller belts but they were me- mechanical mechanized roller belts in a big hall whizzing all over the place absolutely whizzing all over the place like a madhouse with goods whizzing from one end of this big hall to another and the message was this is where danny works and he's going to be offered a promotion and i said to danny look i'm just seeing this i don't know what i'm seeing but it looks like a very long conveyor belt really complicated and your dad's telling me you're going to get a promotion he said stop you've told me enough I know it's real. And it turned out that Danny worked in uh, a building that's got the longest in Europe, their home delivery service. They do groceries. And it's a really unusual conveyor belt. And I don't actually describe the mechanism and exactly how it looked. And he had actually just been given a promotion. And that was to the point where the, then Danny Facebooked me, <laughs> wanted to be my Facebook friend, sent me a really nice message saying how much it helped him. Um, and there's some coincidences with that, which I won't go into now. It's very complicated. But um, uh, one thing led to another. And it was a series of coincidences involving Danny and Paul, the place where he worked, that absolutely made me think that this is real. Because the, the problem I have as a medium is I can't give myself my own message because I can always say, well, I might have thought this up. Yes. You know, um, but So what happens with me is is that I get these most amazing coincidences. It's almost as if... The spirit world is trying to say, okay, Ian, we'll, we'll convince you it's real. And I get these most outrageous, unlikely coincidences, um, which couldn't possibly, I mean, uh, which leave me scratching my head, but, but, but which everybody experiences. I'm, I'm sure it's happened to you, Sandra. Anybody who strays into this field ends up with these synchron, synchronous synchronicities. Synchronicities, yes. Yeah. So, um, so the, where I am at the moment is um, I'm now sort of um, just, toddling along I've, I've reduced my hours now i'm just working part-time and um i i give messages to my patients i i thought i might become a platform medium but that never happened um but uh i seem to be more involved in lecturing and talking about this stuff and educating people about these experiences um i i think i don't want to proselytize for spiritualism because i don't consider myself to be a spiritualist but i think and I don't do belief. I mean, I don't say I disbelieve, but I, I, I follow where the evidence goes. And I think the evidence so far leads me to think that, first of all, we are much greater than, than, we, than we know. And that I bet on money on it. I wouldn't bet the farm, but I bet money on it that we do survive mm-hmm. death. Um, and um, I think this needs to be debated. It's interesting that more and more doctors are coming out now, and there's Eben Alexander, yes, the, you know, the guy who's very bravely come out and talked about his near-death experience. And I think you interviewed Piero Calvi Parasetti, and Eben who I Alexander, met, yes, yeah, who I met recently mm-hmm. at Glasgow. Um, so more and more, and of course there's Sam Parnia who's doing, uh, and Pim Van Lommel who's looking at near-death experiences. So I think more and more doctors are are coming into this, but. Um, so there we are. That, that's my story, Sandra. It's excellent. It, tell us a little bit about the book, because I uh, downloaded your book on Kindle yeah, yeah. Um, just a couple hours okay. before I called you. Consulting Spirit, A Doctor's yeah. Experience with pra- Practical Mediumship. Yeah, so so I kept notes in a Microsoft Word file, and um, uh, and you know, just jotting it down so, so I could get my head around it. And um, Every every time I meet a medium, um, they uh, my the circle they have visiting mediums. They say, 
you're going to be writing a book one day. And I thought, yeah, there's no way. I don't get time for this. <laughs> um, and then um, the, one evening um, in my circle and uh, this other quite experienced media came along, sat next to me, said, you're going to be writing a book uh, very soon. And they tell him it's going to be very soon. And I remember thinking, oh, no way. Well, at the time, I'd given up my car and I bought myself a little folding bike, a Brompton folding bike. I was happily pedaling around my practice, doing all my home visits. Um, I was like a kid. I was really enjoying it. And then um, I was cycling through an alleyway and uh, wobbled and clipped my left kneecap against the fence and broke my knee, my kneecap. Not a big break, but just enough that I had to take six weeks off at work and sit at home with my left knee outstretched. And I suddenly remembered what this medium said. And I thought, you know what? I better get writing this book in case they send the boys around to break the other knee. Just in case <laughs> they get the message. So I started, I mean, I was actually bored out of my mind and I had six weeks. So, uh, and my wife was at work. I was at home on my own. And I just got cracking and wrote the book. So at the end of six weeks, I had my book and I started to try and tout it around various publishing houses. Um, but I got rejection after rejection after rejection. And then as luck would have it, have it, I said to my wife, you know, I think I need an agent. And as I said it, um, the email uh, icon on my computer started flashing. And it was Keith Bishop, you know, the PR guy who got yes, me into his first yes. And, he, and he, let, he hadn't seen him for three years. He knew I'd got into spiritualism. And um, he, he said, oh, how's it going, in? How's the spiritualism going? Um, and he told me what he was doing. And I, and I emailed him back and saying, funny you should say that uh keith i've just written a book you're on the first page and i think i need an agent and with that he said i'll be your agent and i know the very person i know michelle pity from hay house perfect i said yeah you think so send me the manuscript i thought this is it this is amazing mm. the spirits want this book published it's gonna happen sent the manuscript to hay house and they rejected it oh <laughs> well and i think how does this happen how can this happen um, and I heard that I, I thought it just goes to show that you mustn't read too much into these coincidences. You know, um, they are signs that the, that the universe is connected, um, that they are linked. But it doesn't necessarily mean things are going to turn out how you think. They're just like little way markers letting you know that there is something going on in your life and that you're on a path and that the path has meaning. It, but it, it, actually, nothing ever materialized. Keith put me in a couple of people, but no one in, in the UK would publish it. And I was just about to hit. Um, uh, send on Amazon Create Space, space, and suddenly I thought, you know what? There's an awful lot of people who speak English on the other side of the Atlantic. I wonder if the Americans would be interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I looked, I looked up Anomalous Books, um, which is uh, the Anomalous Magazine in America, and wrote to them, and I got an email back from a guy called Patrick Weege, who's very well known in UFO circles. I thought, I got an email from Patrick. That's amazing. And he said, look, you know, send me the manuscript. I probably won't publish it, but I'll have a look at it. Then two days later, he said, no, it's great. I want to publish it. But there's just one thing. You have to rewrite it in American English. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that was fun. I mean, that was real fun. And we had a, had a great time working with Patrick because, um, you know, talk about uh, uh, the difference between American and, and, and British English. I have to say, I'm, I've now become much enamored with American English. It's a lot more logical than British English. Oh, um, funny. So there, so there we go. But, I mean, things like, you don't know what car parks are. Um, you don't know what a bonnet is in a car and stuff like that. Um, you don't know what a council house is. All these things I had to change. I don't think I got some of the words quite right. So I book sort of, for English, Eng when English people read it, they think this is very strange. It doesn't quite sound right. But as I'm an American, sure that... I can read it very clearly. You, yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the audience is actually probably, well, it's an American publisher. So why not? God bless America. You guys published it. I'm very happy for it to be in American English. Well, and I can tell you, Ian, it is a great read. You, uh, like I said, I'm only an hour into it. But your stories, there's so many more stories than even you shared right now. Um, they just give me goosebumps into what's possible. Oh, and yeah. yeah. And, I love it. And, that, I, and everything absolutely happened as it's written there. I mean, yes. you know, I was, I was keeping contemporaneous notes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean when I, I, I actually, because what happens is you go through phases when, Nothing much happens. Life is normal. You may get a few messages. And then you go through a phase when the really weirdest coincidences happen. And you know that, that something odd is going to happen, that, that, that you're being maneuvered into a different position. Mm -hmm. um, and I just accept that now. Um, mm -hmm. It's great when the weird stuff starts happening. 
Um, but I have to say, now the mediumship stuff has become quite pedestrian. You know, I can, when the time's right, I can tune in, I can give a pretty decent message, hopefully. Um, sometimes it's not always um, tuning into spirit. Sometimes it's just the psychic level. Um, and you know what the differences are. I mean, psychic level is you're picking up people's energy uh, sort of um, right. on, on this plane. Um, it's like tuning into a higher frequency. And then uh, spirit world ostensibly exists at higher frequencies. So and then you start picking up messages from deceased relatives, um, people. So sometimes I'm not actually sure what, what level I'm working at. Um, but then at odd times when it's often significant events or, or big things are happening in my life, um, then coincidences start happening. And I guess that happens to a lot of people. But I actually think that happens to everybody, but we just don't recognize the signs. We don't. So one, so one thing I talk about with my patients now, because I do a lot of counseling, it's not just the mediumship, but actually getting them to look at what I call divining their life. So, you know, in divination, you look at patterns and try and make sense of it. So, I mean, you could look at tea leaves, patterns in tea leaves, you could look at tarot cards. I actually think that they're just props. Mm -hmm. um, for your intuition to sort of work out um, what the pattern is that you're living in. And I think what I try now is to get patients to look at the patterns in their lives and see what meaning it has for them and seeing what that, what that means for them and where their lives are going. I'm doing more and more of that sort of work now. Wow. Do you only work with your patients or can people consult you for a medium reading? No, no, I just, just, no I just, just work with my patients, yeah. really. I don't, I don't do this privately. Well, that's um, one of the reasons I asked you is yeah. I, I just envision you're going to get a lot of emails, so we'll just stop that. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, I, I, don't, I, I can put people in touch with other people, but uh, yes. no, I, I can't do email readings or anything no. like that. I mean, I, I know people who can. I've, I've got a patient called Barbara who's really good at this sort of thing. But, um, but no, no, so I, I suppose really what I'm most interested in, as I always have been, is, is people's life stories and development. So, so you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a medical student, you learn um, how the human body works, and you, and you learn to make a physical diagnosis. As a yes. doctor, you you then learn, as a young doctor, you learn that that you have to look at the psychology. So you make a psychological and a physical diagnosis. As a primary care physician, you know that the person's social um, media makes a difference. So then you have to make a social and a psychological and a physical diagnosis. And now I'm thinking about the next phase is really a spiritual diagnosis. By spiritual, I mean a diagnosis where involve where the patient comes to comes tries to work out what their meaning, the meaning of their life is. And more than that, what the meaning of their symptoms are, because I've now come to the conclusion that we're much more complex beings and that often uh, your body tells you what the problems are in your life. So we, we say we have a life, so life's a pain in the neck or it's a pain in the ass yes. or, or someone's uh, under a lot of pressure and they get backache, they're carrying a heavy burden. So now I'm trying to work at this level and try and see how people can make sense of this and I ask people what their mission in life is because I also think, suspect that we come into this life with a purpose. It's a bit like the Bourne identity. You know, Jason Bourne's had his mind wiped and he doesn't know who he works for. He doesn't know what his mission is. So he has to find out who he is and, and what, his, what his plan is. And I mm -hmm. think we're all like Jason Bourne. We come into this life, we've taken on a, we have some lessons we have to learn. But the game is you don't know who you really are and you don't know what the lessons are you have to use the resources around you to find out who you really are and what the lessons are. But I think we're given signs in our lives. And I think if we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, we can pick up on that. But it's difficult. It is. And like you said earlier, times when there's highest energy, I've found that to be true as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also that there is a difference between your analytical mind and the mind that can bring through these bits of inspiration or bring through mm. deceased loved ones. And, and while your conscious mind or your analytical mind is real busy, um, that's not where your imagination uh, is. So to mm. put one aside and work more, a little bit more with your imagination and, and just allow for whatever might show up. Yeah, but I mean, the, the word imagination has got the connotations. And what I now say is, we, 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 because in the West we think of the imagination as something which is fantasy, mm -hmm. but I now think of it as, a, as an imaging faculty. Yes. So the imagination is a faculty for imaging, and yes, it can be used for fantasy, but also you can use it as a faculty to receive images from wherever. It's obviously from your unconscious mind, but where's that ultimately coming from? And ultimately, what is the unconscious mind? And then you start asking questions of what is, I mean, who are we? 
um, what is time and what is space. I mean, uh, uh, here's my current position. Um, physicists don't know the nature of time. It's really not understood at all. But Einstein tells us that time and space are the same thing. So if we don't understand the nature of time, we don't really understand the nature of space. And there's the hard problem of consciousness. No one understand, understands why we are conscious beings. I mean, science can't answer that. So we don't know who we are. So we don't know where we are. We don't know when we are. We don't know who we are. If I have a patient who doesn't know who they are, where they are, when they are, I say they're confused. So I take it that uh, humanity's initial stance is that, that we're all confused. Um, and once you accept the fact we really don't know much about what about anything, despite the great great strides in in science, mm-hmm. then it's all up for grabs. And I'm coming to the conclusion that actually the material world is not primary. I think it's consciousness that's primary. Um, but we could go. I mean, that's probably a bit deep for this conversation. Yes. Well, <laughs> I think it's time to bring the conversation yeah, I, to an end, yeah, and I'm yeah. really excited to hang up with you on the recording and go back to reading your book because it's fascinating it's just really great and uh, dr ian thank you so much for your time and your words and your journey and it's exciting you know and i'm sure you're still living embracing the new and the synchronicities and yeah and, yeah trying and to and there might be another the there might be a, there might be another book at some stage now i've got some more time to write so I wish you the compliments of the season yes. and uh, have, a, have a good one. Thank you. And for our listener, thank you for taking the time to listen. You can visit uh, Dr. Ian Rubenstein's website at drianrubenstein.com or simply go to wedontdieradio.com, click on episode 133, and I have a link to his book and to his website. And uh, just as a reminder, if you go to wedontdieradio.com, feel free to join the Insiders Club where you can read a free copy of my book and also uh, listen to the audio how to survive grief which has made a huge difference in um, <clears throat> several thousand lives because um, grief is a tough one and in closing i want to just thank you for listening we are rounding the end of the year here recording this in 2016 it's been a good one and 2017 be open for the magic be open for an adventure be open for your guides giving you signs and and just something new So my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio, and I personally do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on Earth is important. So make it a great day. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon.